magic. It comes in many shapes and forms, from wand waving to force wielding to web slinging. Magic systems are what make your fantasy story different from all other fictions. And as the world's next big author, you want to create something that is as interesting and in-depth as some of your favorite stories. But how do you do that? Easy! You give your character all the abilities you can think of, and then the whole story is about how many times they can crash through a building and still live. Okay, now seriously. I want to introduce you to Sanderson's Three Laws of Magic and how we can use those on our own stories to create fantastic magic systems. First of all, if you don't know who Brandon Sanderson is, let's do a quick catch up. He's written a multitude of bestsellers, some of the most unique and in-depth magic systems that I've ever read. From Way of Kings, where the magic comes from these massive storms, or one of my personal favorites, Mistborn, where Mistings get different powers depending on the different types of metals they consume. It was while writing this book that Sanderson came up with his three laws in order to make magic more satisfying, more interesting, and less boring for the readers. Alright, let's jump right into it, Sanderson's first law. Your ability to solve a problem with magic in a satisfying way is directly proportional to how well the reader understands said magic. Now, what does that mean? Let's simplify that, okay? So, let's say that we have our character here. His name is Stevie Wondercut. He has a sword that can cut through anything. In the scene in question, Stevie has been thrown into a dark, deep pit of despair, and no amount of cutting or slashing can get him out of it. But then, suddenly, Stevie's sword bursts into flames and it rises him up from the pit, allowing him to defeat all of his foes and save the day. Reading this, your audience might be a little confused, but left in awe, but not satisfied. And why? I set a rule at the beginning that Stevie's sword can cut through anything. But then, unexpectedly, I broke that rule, and then therefore losing my audience's understanding of the magic system. Instead of creating a triumphant moment, I created a comedic moment. Now, if you're going for a comedic moment, and you're wanting to reveal a new power, this spontaneous reveal could actually work perfectly. In Into the Spider-Verse, Miles out of nowhere turns invisible for the first time, and it's hilarious. This scene was there to make the audience laugh and show off a new power. Now, let's take a look at Harry Potter and the Half-Blood Prince. There's a scene near the end where Harry has to fight off an endless horde of inferny zombies. His more powerful mentor, Dumbledore, is incapacitated. All hope seems lost. But just as Harry is overtaken by the zombies, Dumbledore rises and destroys them all with a blast of fire from his wand. This wasn't satisfying. But Moon, I hear you shouting, this scene was awesome and incredible. And yes, it was incredible, but not for the same reasons. It's actually a perfect example of the difference between satisfying and spectacular. Harry Potter's magic system is very soft, and we have at least a partial understanding of the magic Harry uses himself. But Dumbledore is a grand master wizard. Neither we nor Harry have any real concept of what he's capable of. So when he calls down a great storm of fire and smites his enemies, it edges on feeling more like the hand of God than the efforts of a human. This isn't bad. Spectacle can be great, and the scene is certainly spectacular to watch, and an excellent display of Dumbledore's power shortly before his untimely... But this wasn't as satisfying as if we were to watch Harry overcome this by his own wit. Inventing a new power on the spot, or having someone more experienced save them, does solve the present problem, but it leaves your audience feeling disappointed, especially if you've led up to the scene the whole book. If the characters didn't earn it, then the audience feels like they too didn't earn it. Now let's go back to the first law. I think a more understandable way of writing it is, your audience can't properly appreciate overcoming a problem with magic unless they understand how that magic works. The better that understanding, the more appreciation they will have. I think one of the best examples for satisfaction over spectacular is Avatar The Last Airbender. Now I know, I know, another person who talks about books, who talks about Avatar, but it really is that good. Please go watch it. It's amazing. Like, just, just do it. Now there's a lot of good scenes that I could go to for this, but the one that comes to mind is one of my favorites and it's called The Runaway. So in this episode, Katara and Toph are stuck in this wooden cell. At this point in the show, it's been well established that Katara has the ability to control water with her mind and use it as a weapon. But the people who imprisoned her have been very careful to remove all the water sources. So now the problem is, how do they get out? 
Katara soon realizes that if she can build up enough sweat, she can use the water from her own body to slice through the wooden bars. Um, Katara? Are you okay? Just fine. Well, what are you doing? I'm making my own water! The scene is excellent because it acts kind of like a puzzle where all the pieces are set and we as the audience can take those pieces and figure out the solution on our own. We can come to that same logical conclusion as our characters and feel that triumphant moment when we see them finally overcome their problem. So when we watch our girl figure out something on the fly based on what we already knew about waterbending, we go, Woo! Yeah, baby! That's what I've been waiting for! It's important to understand that while it's important to give your audience a basic understanding of the magic system, not every story is the same. Harry Potter is based off this feeling of mystical and whimsical. And explaining the ins and outs of that magic system would kind of take all of that away from the reader. But inadvertently, while explaining your magic system to your reader, you need to be careful not to overload your readers with every single nuisance of your magic at all at once. I promise, even if you think it'll be super interesting to learn about, most readers will start to feel like they're being lectured and become bored unless you release this information slowly and naturally. So how do you do that? Start by showing small parts of your magic system. Show a little bit of what it can do. Show a little bit of what it can't. As you progress your story and characters, progress with the readers learn about your magic through their own experimentation, success, and failures. Can the sword that cuts through anything cut through something that's been enchanted to never break? Can it cut through sound waves? Also, if your magic system is vast and somewhat unknowable like the magic in Harry Potter, make sure you focus on the magic spells your characters will be using to solve problems. In Harry Potter Prisoner of Azkaban, we introduce the Time Turner and the Patrona spell. We focus on what these two things can do and what they can't do, so that when the ending comes we feel satisfied when it's revealed that future Harry was the one who saved himself, and not only that, but cast the strongest Patrona spell he's ever seen. Sanderson's Second Law Limitations are more interesting than powers. As writers, coming up with the magic might seem like the most important part to your magic system, but actually counterintuitively, it's the things that your magic can't do that makes it more interesting. If we go back to Stevie Wondercut and then Jimmy, the master swordsman, Stevie would wreck this dude. That's kind of a boring story, to be honest. But if instead, Stevie's sword is now sentient, and has been sentient from the beginning, and absolutely refuses to kill another sword by slicing through it, now we have an interesting story. Now, Stevie can't rely on brute force. He has to use his wit and his own skills to get through this problem. We like seeing our characters struggle to get out on top. Brandon Sanders' Mistborn could have just been people that could fly and use telekinesis, but instead he grounds them a little bit by making sure that all they can do is push and pull on metal. And in that way, we see them trying to figure out how to use coins as weapons by pushing them at people. We see them traversing the city by pulling on the metal above them or dropping a coin on the ground and using it to fling them into the sky. How they problem solve becomes a lot more interesting to read about. This is why heroes like Superman are so hard to write about. For instance, what do we use to raise the stakes for a Superman story? Kryptonite. Kryptonite basically functions by instantly removing all of his powers and rendering him weaker than the average human. This isn't exactly a good way to add a limitation. After so many renditions of Superman, people have gotten pretty creative with how they can use Kryptonite to make it more interesting, but it's still the same general concept. And this is why Smallville was such a good show. Yes, it still had the Kryptonite per episode problem, but the best episodes were the ones where Clark struggled with his relationships, with his school life. It's a story of a boy becoming a man. Superman can do almost anything with his powers, but his limitations are where his powers can't help him. There are three main ways you can add limitations to your magic system. You have your general limitations, your weaknesses, and your cost. Limitations are what your powers can't do. Vin, from Mistborn, can't pull on anything that isn't metal. Superman can't see through lead. Essentially, limitations are what's holding your magic back from being all-powerful. Weaknesses are things that your magic is vulnerable to. This is things like Superman's kryptonite. You can see how adding kryptonite every episode might become a problem, 
Of the three, weaknesses are probably the weakest way to limit your magic. It's good to keep note of the limits you're adding and try to make sure that you aren't just adding a bunch of weaknesses to your magic system. Cost is what you have to spend to use your magic. This can either be concrete, like having to use a vial of metal every time you want to use your power, or more abstract, as in an enchanted ring that makes you slowly go insane the longer you use it. The best limitations will have real effects on your characters and your plot. Limitations are there to make life for your character more difficult in interesting ways. You never want a limitation that's there that's never used, or a cost that's theoretically there and never runs out. We like seeing characters who have very limited powers, who use them in interesting ways. It's also almost always thematically satisfying if the limitation mirrors the character's inner struggles and then ties in with their character arcs. Sanderson's third law. Expand what you already have before you add something new. If you love to world build, you might find that it's very easy to get caught up in adding more and more to your magic system, thinking that bigger is better. And though expansive worlds are great, it could hinder you from adding detail to the small bits of your magic. Franchises seem to make this mistake all the time. They want the stakes to get higher, so they start adding more and more villains. Spider-Man 3 and Pirates of the Caribbean 3 struggle with this a lot. Instead of focusing on one really good villain, they add multiple, and in turn, they have less screen time and less time to establish their motivations. Avatar The Last Airbender only had four different bendings in its magic system, and it's known as one of the best shows and one of my favorite magic systems. It does so well with taking just those four elements and expanding on each one, where we see waterbenders moving plants, and then the very blood inside of people. Earthbenders can move not only rock and dirt, but the rock impurities inside of metal, and even affect the temperature of the earth to create lava. It's all about quality over quantity, and depth over breadth. Brandon talks about three different ways that he likes to expand his own magic systems. Extrapolate, interconnect, and streamline. Extrapolate is about expanding your magic into your world setting or plot. Like, how does being able to create fire change how the Fire Nation traverses the land? How does being able to push and pull on metal change the weapons and army? Interconnect is tying your powers, cultures, and themes together. Mistborn has a lot of different powers, and it started off as an odd batch of powers that didn't really make a lot of sense together. But then Brandon decided to base the powers off what a group of thieves would want to be able to do, and then he named each power after a role of a thieving crew. Streamline is about taking what you have and then expanding it to other cultures and discussing how they might use it differently. One little example of this is the swamp in Avatar. It's home to waterbenders, but they use their bending far differently than the ones who live in the North and South Poles. And even the North and South Poles have differences, like North doesn't allow women to learn offensive waterbending and only allows them to learn healing. And after all of this is said and done, and you've expanded your magic system, and you've developed how it affects every continent on your planet, don't throw all of this at your readers at once. Arcane Ascension has a massive magic system and complex world. This is the first book in the series, and it has eight types of magic, and each of these magics has two mana types to each one. And this is only in one district of this continent, and there are seven others. Seven other eight different types of magic systems. And that's just on one continent. There is a different magic system on every other continent in this world. This is just a bit much to throw all at your readers in the first book. But if you really want to, there's nothing stopping you. It's completely fine, and there is an audience for it. My husband loves these books. But if you're wanting to hook a larger audience, then you might want to try going a little bit slower. Introducing one or two magic systems in the first book, expanding on those, and then by the second book, start introducing more of those. And then by the third, you can introduce the other district's powers. And then introduce the other continent. Now, there is another law that Sanderson calls his zeroth law. And this one says, Always err on the side of what is awesome. This is less of a law and more of a reminder of where stories begin. As a fantasy writer, most of my ideas come from these small scenes of something awesome happening. And then I take that and decide what kind of world and magic would I need for that to work. For Brandon's example, he says his story, Way of Kings, began when he thought that a knight with superpowered armor would be really cool, and then he built a whole plot off of that. So just know that if you're building a magic system from scratch, the first thing you really want to do before diving into all these rules is decide what kind of magic you think would be awesome. 
What do you want to see your characters do? And write all of your ideas down. Some might work together, some might not work for your current story at all, but you might use it for a different story. Figure out your awesome factor and then come back and try out these rules on it. So, in conclusion, Sanderson's three laws are the more your readers understand your magic system, the more satisfied they will be when you solve problems with it. Two, your magic system's limitations are just as important, if not more important, as the magic itself. Three, before creating new elements to your magic system, expand on what you already have. Now, as a last note, do keep in mind these laws aren't strictly laws. You don't have to use them to create a great magic system. It's just something that kind of gets your mind turning and thinking, oh, why do I like that magic system in Avatar? Why do I love Spider-Man but hate Man of Steel? These are things that I was thinking of and trying to process, and reading these rules helped me really understand what I did see that was great in them and what was terrible and didn't work. You might have a completely different opinion than mine, and that's fantastic. You might love Man of Steel and want to figure out why you love it. Do that. Figure that out and apply it to your own story and your own magic system. What do you want to see in your story? Because at the end of the day, it's all about creating something that you love. I hope I've helped you a little bit with your storytelling and world building. I know that these laws have really helped me. If anything, maybe this sparked a motivation in you to start writing your own story. Now go my little storytellers, write something great. I'll see you all next week and have a great day.